This is a story of creation and a fall. This is a story of a calling. This is a story of slavery. Good morning, Vintage. How are we doing today? Everything going well? Good. Grateful to hear it. I'm glad you guys are pumped up. I'm really excited to be here. My name is Jason Priddle. I'm the discipleship director here at our Metairie campus. I facilitate usually our Connect team on Sunday mornings, as well as help oversee some of our community groups. And I've been blessed with the opportunity to preach God's word this morning. Pastor Jim and all the pastors were generous to, you know, throw me into the fire a little bit, see how it went. So, um, first of all, Pastor Jim mentioned this. We just want to say thank you so much for dedicating your Sunday to be here. Whether you're here for the very first time, we see a lot of new faces, which are really blessed to have you, or if you've been here from the very beginning, it's an honor for us at Vintage to worship God with you and that you would come and share and journey with us. Um, right now, our Connect teams are gonna come down, pass out copies of the Bible. Um, as they're doing that, take a look. You have V-notes on your seats. We'd like to encourage you to take out uh, your pen, jot down some notes, raise your hand if you need a Bible. All right, and if you don't have a copy of God's Word, we'd love for you to hang on to that and keep that as our personal gift to you. One more thing I'd like to mention before we jump in, our green cards. Those are really key. Pastor Jim mentioned them already. Especially if you're a first-time guest, just go ahead, check the box there, and please fill in whatever information you're comfortable with. If you have a prayer request, you're interested in community groups, RV teams, anything like that, we'd love to follow up with you and just express to you that we're grateful that you're here and also let you know that we're here to help you in any way we can. Um, let's pray together before we dive into God's word. Let's pray, guys. Father God, thank you for your word and revealing yourself to us through the person and work of your son, Jesus Christ. And God, open our hearts and minds today, Lord, to what specifically you have to say to each and every one of us, Lord, and um, help us to apply your gospel message to our hearts and our lives transform us more and more to the image of your son, God, and um, help us to live our lives in the power of your Holy Spirit each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's turn in our text for today. It's Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 25. We'll give you a sec to get there. Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 25. Specifically today, we're going to examine the cross of Christ. We're in the sermon series called Story. We're going through the entire Bible over the course of of the year. We finally landed in the New Testament and the Gospels. Today, our sermon is, why the cross? Why the cross? What does it mean? Why is it the focus of all of history and the focus for us individually as we seek out purpose in life? Let's begin by reading the text together. Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 25. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus turned and said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Now, before we dive into the text today and really kind of dig in and examine what's happening there, it's important for us to catch up on a little bit of context. We're gonna, what we're going to do is examine the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus and Peter, who are our two persons mentioned in the passage today, as well as kind of review some of the things that we've been seeing in our sermon series over the past three weeks, specifically looking at the Gospels. Well, Jesus is always a good place to start, right? 
So let's investigate the life of Jesus as well as, again, some of these things that we've seen over the past few weeks in story. So to start with, most amazingly and incredibly, we know that Jesus is to be born of a virgin and conceived of by the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that just about trumps the only thing I remember learning in seventh grade biology class, all right? So it's obviously amazing. There's something special going on with this person, Jesus, as soon as he jumps on the scene. However, despite this heavenly, miraculous conception, Christ was actually born in a barn with donkeys and goats. Now, I don't know about you guys. I'm a city guy, so I don't do the country much with barns, but they smell kind of funny. I don't really know what's happening there, right? The thing is, is these are really humble circumstances for someone to come into the world, especially someone who's supposed to be the king of the Jews, right? That's what the angels came and told the Lord's parents, Mary, and his adopted father, Joseph. That's what they told him. He was going to be the king of the Jews, the Messiah, this is the redeemer of Israel. And what happened shortly thereafter was the king of Galilee, where Jesus was born, Herod, recognized that there was this king of the Jews that immediately was born. And he says, well, I can't have this. This is going to trump my dynasty. There's going to be rebellion and all these different things. So what does he do? He seeks out Jesus from among all the people, and he goes and he kills all the babies under the certain age that he knew Jesus was in all of Galilee. Now, luckily, fortunately, God's providence was on the Lord Jesus, right? And so angels came to his parents and let them know, hey, you guys need to flee to Egypt. So we see that Jesus actually grew up as a refugee in a foreign land, fleeing from a tyrannical leader who was out to kill him and committed genocide against his own people, all the boys of the land. So pretty crazy circumstances to come into. Eventually, we know that Jesus was able to return to Galilee, right, where he grew up as a good Jewish boy just like everyone else. He went to the synagogues and he learned the scriptures. And obviously, we already established there's something special about Jesus, right? He had an intimate, amazing knowledge of the scriptures. And he turned out to be valedictorian of his entire class, right? He's trumping all the other little Jewish pupils and, ah, ha, ha, you're so weak. All these different things, right? But not only that, he starts to trump the professors, right? He starts to trump the teachers. They visit the temple in Jerusalem, and it turns out that Jesus is teaching them the scriptures. So even as a teenager, again, we see there's got to be something special about Jesus. He's got to be destined for a specific purpose, something important. We see that Jesus continues to grow up into adulthood, into manhood. He takes on the skill of carpentry, right, the adopted skill that he has from his father, which at that time, carpentry, you know, it was a respectable, but it was also a very humble occupation. It was nothing amazing or special that would indicate to us on the surface that anything special is going on in the life of Jesus. But we know that those around him as well as Jesus himself knew that he had a specific purpose. So about age 30... Jesus recognizes that the time has come to carry out his life's purpose and his destiny. And everyone else, again, around him knew that something special was going on. They'd heard, okay, he's supposed to be king of the Jews. He's going to be Messiah. But what does that look like? Most people thought it was going to be a political rebellion because they were being oppressed by the Romans. Their king was a tyrant. They thought that the Messiah was going to come and wipe away all things and bring peace and restore national identity to Israel. But that's not exactly what Jesus had in mind and what the Father had in mind. So Jesus, to burst on the scene, what is he going to do? He's going to come forth with his identity. The time has come. We know that Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, was going out throughout the wilderness. He was preaching repentance to Israel and preaching the coming of the kingdom of God, saying that people must be baptized in order to embrace and come into new life in God. Now, Jesus came to be baptized by John at the Jordan River, and something there amazing happened, right? When Jesus comes out of the water from being baptized, the heavens open up, it says, bright light, everyone's blinded. The Holy Spirit rushes in and comes down on the Lord Jesus, and then God's voice like thunder resounds, this is my son, in him I am well pleased. I don't know about you guys, but that's a pretty amazing launch party, right? I'd love to see that for Vintage at us when we launch our next campus. You know, we cut the little ribbon. This is Vintage Church with them. I am well pleased, you know. Production, y'all got to get on that, right? We got to, you know, pray for the Spirit. So that being said, Jesus' baptism is a pretty amazing launch party, right? He's signifying, hey, I'm special. You guys better take note. So after his baptism, he goes forth, right, and he's teaching in the countryside. 
He's teaching in the countryside. He's teaching in a way that the people recognize he's got authority. They recognize that there's something special about this guy. Unlike the the scriptures say, the chief priests and the elders and the teachers of the law, they recognize that Jesus teaches with authority. The rest of them were deceptive, but Jesus teaches with truth. And he taught them they had to be born again to come into eternal life. What does that mean to be born again? He was going to continue to show them. Another important thing that we see in the life and ministry of Jesus is the many miracles that he performed. And that was what we talked about in our sermon series last week. All of Jesus' incredible miracles that he performed during his ministry. And I know in our postmodern, very skeptical environment, we read these miracles and we're like, man, could that really happen? But something we got to know, seminary talk here, but the New Testament really is one of the more, if not the most historically verifiable documents in all of history. Go check it out. Just spend 10 minutes and you'll recognize that even non-biblical scholars recognize that, hey, this document is legit in the things that are going on. So we know and believe these miracles to be true. And these miracles, I mean, Jesus is blowing everybody's mind, right? He's healing the sick. He's casting out demons. He's feeding the 5,000 with just five loaves of bread and a few fish. He's calming the storms with the mere mention of his voice. And the craziest thing to me, the one that flips me out the most, and I wish I was there to see it, his disciples go ahead of him. They're crossing the Sea of Galilee. He says, I'm going to catch up with you. How does he catch up with them? He just says, you know, I'm going to walk on the water. I'm just going to step out and walk on the water. He walks on the water to greet them. The crazy thing is that then he calls his disciples, Simon Peter, to step out on the water with them. Now there's two guys walking on water. I can't figure that, right? It's really amazing to think about all these different miracles that Jesus did, but something that's possibly even more important for us to consider about Jesus' time in ministry, guys, is that he had a specific desire to call to him disciples that were going to be in intimate relationship and friendship with him. He wanted to be a part of their lives. He wanted them to be a part of their lives. Right? He continuously called people to follow him. And throughout his ministry, Jesus knew that he was one with God and that he knew what his identity and his purpose were. And he called his disciples because he also wanted them to know God, understand their identity, and understand their purpose. And we see this in our text from today in verses 24 and 25, right, of Matthew 16. He says to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. So Jesus obviously wants to be in relationship with those who are going to follow him, but we got to ask the question, how does he call his disciples? How how does he go about it? Well, we're going to look specifically at the life of Simon Peter, how the Lord called him. It's a good opportunity for us to understand Christ's calling on our lives. We look in Matthew chapter 4, and we we see that Peter and his brother Andrew were actually the very first disciples to be called after the baptism, after Jesus' launching party, right? They're the very first ones to be called. And Jesus calls out to them, they're fishermen. They're out there fishing, and he recognizes that they're fishermen. And what is, the, what is his invitation to them? What does he say? He says, come follow me, and I'm going to make you fishers of men. Now, the scriptures tell us that they immediately left their nets, and they followed him. They were amped up to follow Jesus. They were really pumped up. Right? Maybe they had heard of him before and all the miracles that he was doing. Maybe they saw or heard about his baptism. Or maybe they were just stoked to follow a rabbi, a religious leader of the time, which brought a lot of prestige along with it. Right? But whatever the case, they left their professions and everything they knew immediately to follow Christ. Here, Peter and his brother Andrew, they have now a new identity in Christ. They were fishermen. Now they're followers of Jesus. And something to think about, guys, is that Christ today is calling each and every one of us to follow him. Just like Peter, it means that we too have to place our identity in Christ and not what we do in life, be it our profession, be it our family, be it the school we go to, be it the football team that we cheer for, whatever the case is, right? We're supposed to be identified in Christ as his follower. That's God's purpose for us. Now, not only was Peter called by Christ and decided to follow Christ, the scriptures tell us that Peter recognized and embraced who Jesus was. Many times the gospels, in the gospels, excuse me, Jesus would ask his disciples who he was or who the people said that he was, 
right? So he would say, who do people say that I am? And they would come up with things like, oh, some people say you're John the Baptist raised from the dead. Some people say you're a demon casting out other demons, you know. Well, that's brilliant. That makes a lot of sense, right? But anyways, the case being, Christ would then call his disciples and say, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, he's the bold one, right? He's always audacious and bold. He's ready to come forth. You're the Christ. You're the Lord. You're the son of the living God. You're the Messiah. You're the Redeemer. Only you have the words of everlasting life. Peter knew and embraced the truth, and he had all the right things to say, and it wasn't from himself. How does we know that Peter had all the right things to say? The Spirit of God empowered him to say those things and revealed that truth in his life. So Peter knows the truth about Jesus and who he is. He's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's come to redeem Israel and redeem the world. But when we look in verses 21 and 22, we also see that Peter still didn't yet fully understand Jesus' purpose. He didn't understand the game plan quite yet, even though he was following him around. Look back in verse 21. It says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed on the third day, be raised to life. Jesus took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. So here, Jesus huddles up his guys, right? He shares the game plan for victory. He says, okay, guys, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to die and be raised again on the third day. So victory secure, right? We got that under under control. But this throws everybody for a loop, especially Peter. He wasn't expecting this, and neither were the disciples, right? Again, they were expecting him to get rid of the corrupt Jewish leaders. They were expecting him to restore national identity. They were expecting him to overthrow the Romans who were oppressing everyone, Uh, They're expecting him to bring freedom to Israel. And, you know, Peter's the bold one, right? So he's always got to be the first one to say something. And he comes up, and what does he say? He musters his pride. And he's basically saying, Jesus, it's not going to go down like that. I've got your back. We ain't going out like that, Jesus. You know, band of brothers, like, hoorah, we ain't going out. You know, that kind of thing. But what does Jesus say immediately after in verse 23? This is strong. You know, he basically rebukes him just about like Pastor Jim rebukes me when the coffee's not the right temperature on Sundays. You know, he comes back and he says, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, these are obviously, and Pastor Jim's not that hard on me, y'all. He's actually a really nice guy. But anyways, so there's something to think about this. All right. Um, These are harsh words for Peter, really harsh words. Right? But what is Jesus revealing about Peter, and what is he revealing about his own plan here? He's showing that Peter's motivation is still his own pride and his own glory. Peter wants the glory for himself, right? He wants to be part of the winning team. He wants to be the one who's part of the crew that brings the Romans down. You know, he's got that ambition. He wants it all for himself. He's selfish. He's only concerned about his own way of doing things as opposed to focusing on God's way of doing things, but Jesus just revealed to him, like, come on, Peter, get it together, man. But you know what? There's something to think about. If Peter, who walked with the Lord, was basically his best friend, saw all of his miracles, received Jesus' truth and teachings on a firsthand basis, still didn't get the plan, and still had that pride and ambition and selfishness in his own life, what do you think that says about us here today? We're sinners, right? All of us, each and every one of us. We've got that pride and ambition in ourselves, and at our core, really, really don't want to follow God's plan. All of us are just like Peter. And, you know, because of this sin, the Bible teaches us that we are eternally separated from a good and holy God. Because of our sin, we deserve eternal punishment, guys. And you know what? The truth is we're going to receive that eternal punishment unless someone steps in to intervene and take that punishment on our behalf, to take the punishment that you and I deserve. Divine punishment, divine wrath. So Jesus here, again, rebukes his friend Peter, who he loves so much, because he recognized and he knew that his purpose was to go to the cross and die for his friend Peter. 
He was looking at Peter. He was looking at his disciples and recognizing. He was looking down the corridor of time, recognizing all those who would come after him. You and me here today and recognize that, man, these people are sinners. These people are sinners. And, guys, i got to fulfill my purpose and go to the cross, take the punishment for all of mankind on the cross. Jesus was focused on the divine plan. And eventually we know that Jesus did go to the cross. How did he get there? Well, he was betrayed by Judas, one of his 12 best friends. Then he was turned over to the chief priests and the elders who basically accused him of blasphemy because he was speaking the truth and saying who he was, that he was the son of God, that he was one with God the Father. They declared him blasphemous. So they said, we got to crucify him. We got to execute this guy. We got to get him out of here. They turned him over to Pontius Pilate, who's a Roman governor. And Pontius Pilate, because he's scared of an insurrection, he's scared of an uprising, he declares that Jesus has got to be flogged and beaten and sent to the cross and crucified. And I want us to think about the cross for a second, because oftentimes in our society, we don't really think about it. You know, the cross makes for a nice little necklace sometimes, or maybe a tattoo if you're gangster. Any tattoos in the house? No? All right. So it makes for a nice tattoo, maybe a little ornament, you know, you send to your little, your niece Nina on Christmas. You know, I don't know. But we often just kind of like make it this pretty thing. But guys, the cross was not meant to be a pretty thing. And in Jesus' time, the cross was a very ugly and horrendous thing. In Jesus' time, the cross was the ultimate symbol of death, torture, scorn, shame, and humiliation. Think for a second about our modern forms of execution. Guys, and I can't even like bring up the names because it's so horrendous. Right? But we, when we think about execution, right, it kind of unnerves us. It makes us feel this pain and angst inside. Man, that's terrible, right? Those images are offensive to us. But let's think about the crucifixion for a sec, guys. Most historians agree and recognize that the crucifixion is the most horrendous, shameful, and excruciating form of execution ever in human history. And that's what Jesus went through. The goal of the crucifixion was to inflict unbearable immense suffering and torture while trying to keep the victim alive as long as as possible. You know what? The Romans were pros at it, guys. So all this talk about, well, Jesus didn't die on the cross. He really kind of got taken down before then or whatever. It's nonsense because the Romans were professionals. They knew what they were doing. Jesus totally died on that cross, and he suffered. His flesh was ripped off his back from the beating that he received. There was a crown of thorns, and they beat it into his head incessantly. You know, and they mocked him saying, aha, king of the Jews. When he was on the cross, you know, they took those spikes and they they drove him into his wrist. And then as he was there up on the cross, every time he breathed, his lungs were like on fire for hours and hours and hours until finally he passed. He gave in. He gave his last breath. And what did he say when he gave his last breath? It's finished. It's finished. It's done. What was finished? Well, we know that his plan was finished. God's plan was almost finished. We got the resurrection coming next, right? But guys, we look at the cross and we recognize that this is how severely God deals with our sin. Our sin is no joke. Christ had to take it for us, guys, and we deserve to be there where he was on the cross. So now we're caught up to our text. Thinking about the cross and examining our passage from today, we're left to ask two questions that we got to answer for ourselves, each and every one of us. Why is it that Jesus had to go and suffer on the cross? And secondly, why does he call us to take up ours and believe in him? The first thing that we know about why Jesus went to the cross and why he suffered on the cross is for God's purpose. For God's purpose. And verse 21 shows that Christ knew all along that he had to die on the cross and raise from the dead to fulfill God's ultimate purpose for him. Even before the beginning of creation, Christ knew that's what he was called to. In verse 21, it says, He explained to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Jesus was one with the Father, so he had an 
intimate, eternal perspective on God's ultimate plan for his glory. You know, the cross was not some reactionary plan B, Hail Mary in the fourth quarter to upset sin, Satan, and death at the buzzer, right? That was plan A from the start. God knew that the cross was man's ultimate ultimate means of redemption to, for God to bring about his shalom, his universal peace. We're going to talk about that in a second. But we see in verse 23 that Jesus rebukes Peter, right, for not having in mind the things of God. So despite temptations and distractions from Satan, despite even his best friends saying, hey, Jesus, you don't got to go out like that. We can do this another way, right? Christ remains focused on fulfilling God's will. As God's son, he submitted to the holy will of the Father as the ultimate example of how you and I in our lives must submit our wills to the will of the Father. Secondly, we see that Jesus suffered for man's forgiveness, for the forgiveness of you and me, for Peter, for all of the disciples, for all of mankind that would come after. Again, Jesus knew that Peter and everyone else was condemned to punishment, eternal punishment in their sin. Only Christ, as a perfect and holy Son of God, was an acceptable sacrifice to take God's punishment and wrath on our behalf, on the behalf of humanity. In 2 Corinthians, the Bible tells us that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of of God. So Christ willingly submitted himself to the torturous death on the cross to provide eternal forgiveness and righteousness for you and me and any and everyone who would come to believe in him. Doesn't matter what language you speak, doesn't matter where you come from, you might need not even like the Saints football team, it doesn't matter. Jesus can forgive you. He can forgive you, right? Thirdly, Jesus suffered for the world's redemption. For the world's redemption. Guys, we know that Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection are not only the means by which you and I are forgiven of our sins, but they're also the means by which God will make everything into a new creation and restore everything under him. In Revelation 21, at the very end of the Bible, right, the end story. I love what Pastor Rob gets up here and he always talks about Revelation because there's a lot of weird things going on and he doesn't quite get it. He's like, I just know Jesus wins at the end, right? That's real deep and theological from our pastor, right? Jesus wins. Amen. That's right. That's what matters. But we look in Revelation 21 at the very end. What does it say about creation? It says that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. All of creation, guys, is going to be restored on the new heaven, new earth, and all via and by the power of the blood that was shed on the cross. Now, I don't know about you, but, I mean, I'm ready for that to come. I want some of that. You know, no more suffering, no more pain, no more death, none of that. You know, the only way that that's going to happen is through the cross of Christ. So now we understand the three reasons why Christ went to the cross and had to suffer for us, but something that we've got to examine and look at the rest of the passage in verses 24 and 25, we have to understand why it is that Jesus calls us to believe, right? He calls us to take up our cross and follow him. Read with me in verses 24 and 25 once again. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. That's good stuff. Christ says that we must take up our cross and follow him in order to truly be his disciple. What does that mean? What does that mean that we have to take up our cross and follow Jesus? Christ here is teaching us that our identity and our life must be completely enveloped in him and who he is and what he's done for us on the cross. Jesus wants us to understand that following him requires that we die to ourselves, to all of our pride, our ambition, our own desires for the way we want things to happen. We got to fully place our faith in him, give up living for ourselves, and by God's grace, entrust every area of our lives to him. 
We've got to make Jesus the master and the Lord of our lives. And again, by God's grace, seek to follow him in area, every area of our lives. And I know that this too is an un- uncomfortable thought in kind of our plush, postmodern, nice, quaint, 21st century American existence. But you know, guys, this verse talking about us picking up our cross, I mean, Jesus may be calling us, if you're a follower of Christ in here, to lay down our lives for Christ. That's what the disciples had to do. They all died for their faith in the Lord Jesus. Think about that. Am I ready to die for Jesus? So we believe. What are the three reasons that we have to believe in Christ's suffering on the cross? First and foremost, reflecting the first set, right? We believe to fulfill God's purpose in our lives. Guys, God created us to be in unity with him, to be in relationship with him. We are his special creation. We're created in his image. He loves us. He wants to be united with us. And only through embracing Christ as Lord can we truly live in communion with him and fulfill the purpose that he has for each and every one of us. A lot of us might recognize Romans 8, 28, right? Maybe we've heard it before, right? And what does it say? It says, for we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, here we've got to recognize something. Who is that promise of good for in the end, who's it for? For those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Guys, the only way, the only way that you and I can really love God in our sinful condition is by God's grace. It's by trusting ourselves to the cross and just saying, God, I submit everything I am to you. That's the only way to truly love God and understand and be called according to his purpose. Secondly, we believe to receive God's forgiveness. We kind of already talked about this, right? But there's no other way in all of creation by which man can come and be redeemed and forgiven of his sin before holy, righteous God. And in fact, Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In our society, that's a difficult thing to say, right? We're very postmodern and exclusive, you know, oh, that sounds very inclusive, you know? What about all the different ways and things like that? I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I'm going to side with the guy who walked on water and rose from the dead three days later. I'm taking his side, right? So the thing is, yes, Christ's call is inclusive. He's the only way, and he said it himself. But you know what, guys? What do you mean? He said he was exclusive, but we know that Christ is so inclusive, right? His salvation is available to each and every person in mankind who's ever existed. All you have to do is place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. What does John 3.16 say? I mean, almost everybody knows this, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever. Guys, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you've done, right? There's no sin There's no addiction. There's no past. There's nothing in your life that you've done that cannot be forgiven by God through the power of the death of Christ on the cross. Thirdly, we believe to experience God's redemption. Guys, I want to tell you something. He wants to make you new today. He wants to make you a new creation. When Jesus came, talked about being born again, how many of us would like a fresh start? Amen? We've got time. I know me personally. I mean, I would love it. You know, I need that fresh start. I've got tons of stuff in my past that I'm not proud of. And again, the amazing thing is that there's nothing that we can do that Christ cannot redeem us from and make us new and fresh. Guys, all of Christ's precious blood was poured out on the cross to free us, to redeem us from the slavery of sin in our lives. You don't have to be a slave to your sin anymore. You can be free from the guilt and the shame that accompanies all the things that you do that you know don't please God. Guys, the scriptures say that in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. His grace is so amazing. Guys, he wants to make you new today. He wants to redeem you today. 
So we've examined these two questions, right? Why is it that Jesus had to suffer on the cross? Why is it that he caused me to believe, to pick up my cross and to follow him? But we got to ask ourselves as well, what does it look like for me to follow Christ, to really follow Christ, to really pick up my cross? What does that tangibly look like, Jason, right? And the first thing we got to embrace and look at is, will I live for God's purpose? And how will I live for God's purpose? And not my own purposes. And I just want to bring up a, a personal example that is really hits home for me. Guys, I think about the life of my dad. You know, I was born into a family. I mean, you know, we were, we were a good, normal family, right? But my dad, all through my childhood up to I was about, you know, 10 years old or so, he was, he dealt with alcoholism. Like, it was tough. You know, he was angry all the time around the house. It was tough coming up, man. But you know, something amazing happened to my dad. He gave his life to Jesus. He made Jesus the Lord of his life. My dad's totally transformed. I mean, he's an awesome witness and testimony for my mom and my brother and me. It's awesome. So he was dealing with alcoholism and all different things. What does he do now? He's dedicating his life to prison ministry. He's going to sharing people who are struggling and hurting. And he's dealing with he's helping people who are in addictions, showing them the light of Christ. That's what it looks like to be a Christ follower. That's what it looks like to take up your cross and follow him and live for God's purpose. The second thing we got to ask is, Will I live for God's forgiveness? In following Christ, am I living for his forgiveness? Am I living in his forgiveness? In Christ, guys, we can confidently walk every single day embracing and recognizing that we are covered in Christ's blood, enveloped in his grace, in his grace and that we're living completely new lives, forgiven of any and everything that we do, both our past sins and even those that are coming before us. Christ died to cover all of them. It says that Christ died once and for all, <laughs> once and for all. His sacrifice was sufficient one time for, the, for all the sins of humanity that will follow afterwards. And so will I live for God's forgiveness? Not only can we walk living forgiven, it frees us up to forgive others, to show grace to other people. I mean, you're always going to have beef probably with somebody. Somebody's getting on your nerves. You got your Aunt Susie who just won't shut up at the Thanksgiving reunions, whatever the case might be, right? You're going to be able to show grace to them, show forgiveness to them, because you know why? Christ has shown forgiveness to you. Thirdly and lastly, before we close it out, will I live proclaiming God's redemption? Will I follow Christ and live to proclaim God's redemption? This message of the cross that we're talking about here today is meant to be, be proclaimed, guys. It's meant to go out and go forth. And you know what? It's not just the role of the pastor and the discipleship director and the seminary student, all these people. God has specifically placed people in each and every one of your lives that need this. They need Jesus. They need this cross. And you know what? God has uniquely and specially equipped you each and every one of you, to reach them in a way that anyone coming up here and speaking can't reach them. God's put those people in your circle. So the question we have to ask ourselves, am I going to live proclaiming God's redemption with my life, with my actions, as well as with my conversations and the things I say? Am I going to talk about Christ? Am I going to share this message of the cross with people? Romans 10 tells us, it says, there's no other way by which people come to recognize the cross unless someone tells them about it. It says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. You guys are being sent today. So once again, who am I proclaiming Christ's redemption to with my life, with my actions? Who am I proclaiming Christ to in my conversations with the things that I say? And guys, we're going to close out. And my prayer and encouragement for each and every one of us here today is that we would recognize and embrace that for all of us today, Christ is calling us to pick up our cross and to follow him. That's going to look different for each and every one of us. Perhaps today you've never recognized Christ as the Lord of your life. You've never given your life 
to Christ. You never embrace the forgiveness that's for you on the cross. And I want to let you know, I believe today is the day of your salvation. I believe you're going to come to know Jesus today. If that's the case, recognize that. It doesn't have to be this super spiritual thing and you come up to the front and, you know, we're all going to high five you and lay hands on you. Nothing like that. It's just recognizing, God, you know what? I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness, God. I need your forgiveness. I need you to make me a new creation. God, I want to give my life to you and live for you. It's just that simple. And it doesn't require any showy nothing like that. Maybe that's your response today. Maybe you need to pick up your Christ and follow Christ. Pick up your cross and follow Christ for the very first time. If you've already made that decision before, maybe you're in here and you're a believer. I know for me personally, there's always an area of my life that I haven't quite totally surrendered to God. I may have not completely following God in, right? And maybe the Lord's convicting, convicting your heart today and say, you know what? You're not really following me there. You haven't really laid that at the foot of the cross. You haven't really picked up your cross in that area. What ways is God challenging you, encouraging you to pick up your cross and to follow him? Let's think about that as the band comes forward. I'm going to pray for us to close out. (sighs) Father God, thank you for the cross. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, thank you that even though we're sinners, Lord, that you made a perfect way for us to be in relationship and fellowship and to spend eternity with you, God. And we confess and believe that that's only by the power of the death of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross, God, and through his resurrection. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will work in hearts and lives right now, that you would stir people to embrace salvation for the first time, Lord, and that you would stir in each of our hearts the desire and the passion to follow you, to take up your cross, take up our cross to follow you in every area of our lives, God, and just submit our lives to you as Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.